Well, what we're going to do tonight, guys, welcome everybody, and 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 I know there's going to be some others joining us on online for, at some stage, but tonight we're just I'm just going to do a because we're still waiting for the books, and I expected yes, to have them a, a new notification, um, but we're we're just going to chase them down, um, but. We're, Pauline told, was told that they're coming on the 14th. On the 14th, next Tuesday. Ring them and say to overnight them. We'll pay for the yeah. overnight career. Yeah, um, that's right. So we'll yeah. have them for next week. So, but I thought what we'd do is go through that, that last study <laughs> again because this is more or less the centre of the course. And and being the centre of the course, I think it's one of the most important issues. Oh, didn't you get in? Didn't you bring in notes? Oh, I thought you were handing more. I didn't. We didn't get the last notes. Okay. Oh, now, why don't we've got another? We've got another set in there somewhere. Why don't I go and get them? Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. It's basically um, <laughs> this is this is one of the most important issues in discipleship, and that's faithfulness. Without faithfulness, nothing works. Mm. And it, this is why I'm spending extra more extra time on it. And unfortunately, in today's climate, um, the throwaway type um, um, attitude and all that sort of thing, people, are, you can't really count on them, particularly when they're not taught that in, in schools and even in homes. It's timing and punctuality is not important. I found that when I was teaching out at the police academy, the biggest problem I had with teaching young people that were coming out of the culture, I couldn't teach them punctuality. And of course, every, you know, a paramilitary organisation like the police, will they must function on reliability and faithfulness. And of course, that's no different to Christianity. In fact, it's more important to Christianity to be able to be functioning in a way, you know what the other person's going to be doing. You go into a situation, you know exactly um, where people are going to be, how they're going to react in any given situation. So it's really important. So I thought we'd, we'd go through that uh, again. And I've I've got, if if you've got page 14. Um, we didn't. Page 14. We didn't get the last notes for the last meeting for some reason. Ah. I did send them. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know what's happened to them. Two, three, four. This must be one. What I'll do is I'll, I'll we can read it anyway. Yeah. And and uh, um. Anybody else want to say? Everybody else. Page fourteen. Yeah. Session four. Yep. Session four, page fourteen, and I, I, I probably gave it to you, and I hope you wrote it down. That passage of scripture that says, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant." That's what I want to hear when I, when, when uh, I get called home. Mm -hmm. I want to hear God say to me, the Lord Jesus say to me, "Well done, good and faithful servant. You've done everything I've asked you to do, and and uh, you've been faithful in what you've been called to do." Now, faithfulness, particularly, I'm going to labour on this a little bit because we're in an environment in our culture today, and I've been preaching on it over the past few months, and that is we don't have a standard anymore on which we see boundaries. And as the, the, word, of, the word of God, the Bible, is being constantly attacked, boundary shift. <laughs> So instead of being able to say, and I mentioned it, and it was in the newsletter about the importance of the absolute necessity of truth, and the the sermon that I entitled uh, the two 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 sermons, uh, there was two sermons I did one after the other, and it was the abolition of truth and the ab abolition of um, accountability, and people aren't accountable. And that they don't know the truth because the truth is changing all the time. We look at it, we see it in the, in the um, um, just about every system 
um, that governs our existence today. The police, and I'm, I'm because I'm, I'm, I'm an ex-policeman, I'm able to say that when I joined the police force, within a very short period of time, things that were illegal, highly illegal, were legal. And it was how do you how do you get that message across to people? How do, how, are you, how do you get them to the say, well, and they're totally confused. Young people got, have got no, and I'm talking about young, young minds, are being manipulated all the time. There's no um, absolutes, and they're taught in school with, uh, under the, the humanism attitude, there's no such thing as an absolute truth. Well, there is, and it's the word of God, it's absolute truth. Now, even now, today, we're finding <laughs> churches are at loggerheads over these things of absolute truth. And I yes, know oh that can't be right because they misunderstand. And I, I laboured on it last Sunday, and I've mentioned it three or four times now in the last few times I've preached, is that if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, anything he asks us or commands us to do will not be a problem. We just want to please him. And we, and it comes back, to understanding that God is faithful. I'm coming back to the faithful point. God is faithful in making sure what he writes in his word comes to pass. And we must have an expectation that God is going to do what he says in his word. And that's pretty exciting. And I believe that as we come to that, we're going to receive more and more and more from God. We're going to see more power flowing through us because we're actually believing you see believing is not just um yeah i believe that, that god is the devils do that and they tremble they believe that god's there but we believe in the goodness of god we believe in the absolute part of god and we know his word tells us that he we are the apple of his eye he just wants the very best for us doesn't matter what we go through and we will, we all go through things. And I, I make a point of letting people know that I go through things. And I don't always get it right. But I know that God is faithful to make it right. He will make it right if I turn to him. And, you know, I feel sorry for people who, who, who were perfect. <laughs> and I mentioned that Sunday because... You know, we, we, we get to the stage where we, um, I just, you know, sometimes I think, no, you're not. The word tells us we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's what it's all about. But I enjoy God uncovering things in my life that he wants me to deal with. And he says, okay, I'm going to help you deal with that. And remember my word, and I'm faithful in this, that you can do nothing without me. Without me, you can do absolutely nothing. Now, that is an open door. I'm there I'm now, and Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labour that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Now, this is the foundation of discipleship. And all, all the... When we, we look at that, I mentioned at the leaders' meetings, we're all different. You're a different person to me. You're a different person to me. All of us are different, and we're different characters. And you know what? God saved you as the character you are. He doesn't want you to change that. He wants to use that character for the benefit of other people with that character. So what he wants us to be, be conformed to is the image of Jesus within that character. Does that make sense to you? You're getting that? Mm -hmm. That is so important that we... He doesn't want us all to be the same. No. He, he's, not, so he, he's not making cookie... Hasn't got the cookie cutter out. And, and saying, you know, this is the way I want you to be. Apart from conform to the image of our Lord and Saviour. But you see, he, he didn't change his disciples into his, his, his um, character. He changed his disciples to be able to use what he had within their character. I don't want to be um, a um, whoever, I mean, there's 
we, we've all got different callings on our lives. And he's chosen us in the midst of that to be very, 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 very good at what he calls us to be. Now, in order, in order to do that, we must be faithful. We must be faithful to that one principle, and that is to him first. And out of that comes everything else. Do you know, in amongst that, I, I only I only thought about this a couple of months ago, actually. I've, I've known that command um, all my Christian life. It's the number one. And I taught it at Sunday School, but I've never really thought about the qualities that he talks about, your heart, your mind, and your body. Heart, your mind, and your strength. That's the triune being. We are triune beings. God said, and it speaks of the Trinity. God said, let us create man in our own image. So with our heart, we believe God. And all, because if, if we're not, it's like faith. And that's a triune thing. First of all, God speaks. Secondly, you believe. And thirdly, you put it into action. And that is faith. They're the, they're the contents of faith. And we need to understand that this is something that is our walk. It's, a, it's our expectation. Instead of having this nebulous thing, like a big cloud that says this is faith, and we can't quite grasp it, that's all we need to do is to understand God speaks, I believe it, and I do it. And if one of those things are missing, it's not faith. Faith will not be produced. That's exciting. I find that very, very exciting because now I know that, first of all, and please get hold of this, first of all, my first port of call is God. My first port of call is God. I come to God and I say, okay, Lord, how do you involve how are you involved in this i know you're involved in every part of my life i want your i want your advice here i think that's a good thing to do every morning and and i've made a habit of being up at 5 30 every morning i go into my study and then they're the first things i say good morning god and and start to talk start to talk and expect him to talk back expect him to talk i can remember years years ago when i was um still in the police force and I was I was in ministry also at Life Ministry Centre, a big church in Melbourne. And um, I was sharing with some people. We have a very large home group. There was 42 people in our home group. It became nearly a church, and it was a church. And uh, But the thing was, um, I was talking about how we need to be telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be active. And a lady was there, and she was a... a RE teacher, religious instruction teacher, RI teacher. And, and I said, I'm prepared to do anything that God tells me to do. And she said cheekily, I believe God telling you to come and minister to my children at the school in your police uniform. I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> and anyhow, as a result of that, I went to five or six schools and with a guitar under my arm, a very bad guitarist, I kid you not, you don't want to hear me play the guitar. <laughs> and I sang a song, Have You Kissed Any Frogs Today? I'll have to sing it to you one day. But it's it's all about, you know, um, kissing, the, you know, you know the, the old fairy tale of, of the princess the Christ, kissed a frog, it turned into a prince and all that sort of stuff. And Have you heard that one? Yeah. And anyhow, <laughs> that's, talking about, that's talking about Jesus um touching us and we're transformed anyhow it was it was a great it's a great christian song really and um um anyhow i wasn't allowed to pray with the kids or anything like that but i said what i want you to do is tonight i want you to go home and before you go to bed <laughs> kneel down beside the bed and pray and ask jesus to speak to you and I want you to tell me, uh, write a letter, whatever, tell me and tell your teacher so I can check it up, what Jesus said to you. Do you know there was hundreds of letters, there was about 500 kids that gave their hearts to the Lord. As a result of that, 
simply saying, I heard Jesus talking to me. And, you know, we can say, oh, yeah, that's just a little bit of a matter. But I know God touched the lives of those kids because they had an expectation. And this is a big thing about us. We need to have an expectation, an expectancy that God wants to talk to us. He wants to communicate. We like to say the words, uh, "This we, we're not in a religion, we're in a relationship. That's a cliche if it's not true. You need to be in a relationship and you need to be able to talk to that person. And this is what God has called us to do. Now, that is what this is foundational in our attitude of discipleship. Seek it with all your heart. Come to know God. Come to know the oh, Jesus died on, and rose again so, so that we could talk with God. We were reconciled to God. And just jot this scripture down, 2 Corinthians 5, 13 to 21. This is the job description at 2 Corinthians 5, 13 to 21. This is the job description of every Christian person. I want you to really look at that, know it, and make it your life's work. This, this is everything that God ever asks us to do. He's given us the, the word of reconciliation, which is the Bible. That's one of the reasons why I hold it so precious. And I am so determined to stand on the word of God, regardless of what it tells me to do. I don't like it, some of it. I don't like what he tells me to do in some of it. That's just because I'm human, believe it or not. <laughs> I don't like that. But the thing is, he says, that I've given you the word of reconciliation and i've given you the power the ministry of reconciliation which is the holy spirit flowing through you god's flowing through you and you are ambassadors for christ and i mentioned it last sunday and i said then he goes on to say that um as i i ask as as though god were pleading through us be reconciled to God. I can tell you that there are, of course, many, many Christians in, in Albury Wodonga that God wants to use but can't because they will not be reconciled to him. They will not believe that step to come into a state of reconciliation. And that it's there. All you need to do is take it. And I you know, and it's not a striving. It, and um, it, it, there, there is, a, there is a, a, a time in the word that it's in Hebrews 3 or 4 where it says that we are to strive to enter the rest. There is still a rest for the people of God. And we should strive to enter that rest. And that means the rest is when we don't do it anymore. God does it through it. You get that? So there is a striving. There's work to do, but that's not a work of righteousness. It's a work of surrender. And we can sometimes say, oh, but I, I, there's no, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have to work. That, that's laziness. That's pure laziness. I want, if you want something bad enough, you'll sow yourself in the getting it, won't you? Yep. Any comments on what I've just said? Please feel free. You, you guys can talk. Uh, no, you're all muted. But raise your hand if you... No? Okay. Good. I really challenge you to think about this because um, I, I grew up um, in, in Christ with that scripture as my foundation. And, from, and there's been times when I've, I've just had absolute days of conversations with God and and just it's just been so beautiful absolutely beautiful and he's been with me all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 <Yeah, anyway. laughs> anyhow um, the thing is this is real this is real and and God is waiting, as I, as I, as I read last Sunday, 
about the, the whole of creation is waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. Isn't that exciting? That the sons of God should be revealed. What happened? What happened? What happened? Danielle has connected to audio. Everyone, Peter. Now, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Disciplines. Yeah. Again. There you go. Down the bottom right. Mute all. Done. Yep. And click. Yes. All right. No more noise. <laughs> I think it was just an accident that Danielle had done her, her um, connection. That's all. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's just a start to. Now, the this this is a calling on our lives that demands faithfulness. Now, I, I'm going to be going constantly referring back to this principle of faithfulness. You don't get this by just saying, okay, I guess if you're there, you should be talking to me. It's a case of seeking the face of God. In, in mo most of the Bible, and certainly in the Old Testament, God says, I will be found of you when you seek me with all your heart. And that's the first Love the Lord your God with all your heart, then all your mind, all your mind you give to God. And this is this fits into Romans 12. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All your mind, give all your mind, all your thoughts, all your all your doubts, all your fears. You know, I get there's a time on the cross at Calvary when Jesus took all our doubts and he spoke it out. And it's one of the things that he spoke out loud. And he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's when he took all the doubts and fears of every person who thinks they can't get in touch with God, that God's forsaken them. Jesus took those on the cross of Calvary so you can receive fully the voice of God in your life. That's exciting. Isn't it? it blows my mind that he should declare that more than any other th anything else, because that's what stops us from coming into a deep relationship with God. We don't believe it. We want to. Remember the, the, the story of the, the man who had the, the sick daughter and, he, and Jesus said, well, do you believe? He said, I believe. Please help my unbelief. And I think we've got to be honest enough to say to God, look, I'm struggling with this. I really need you. And, and he... He wants us to do that. He really wants us to do that. Okay, any other comments? Good. I hope you got it. <laughs> but this is part of growing in God. Expectation. And, and and saying I'm, I'm going to do I, I I give myself, and this is you know um, once again I mentioned it last Sunday, Philippians three ten, where Paul said not that I've already attained because he talked about the struggles that he goes through, and people need to know that we we're all in the same boat, we're struggling with things. So don't feel rotten about it. I feel more rotten when I look at somebody that doesn't seem to have any problems that happen how can i how can i measure up to that the thing is i need to be able to say lord i do have things that I, I've, i'm constantly growing over things and hal oxley my mentor he used to call this the overcomer's walk it's getting rid of the flesh in your life so keep in mind you have the your new creation and one john three nine um it tells us that that he that is born of God is without sin, in fact, cannot sin because he has God, the spirit of God alive within him. So that is the new creation we talk about in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. And that is the new creation. Any man being Christ is a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. So in that sense, we are 
completely saved and right before the throne of God. And that's how we go before the throne of God. And that flesh, Jesus shed, Jesus shed blood, has washed that away. So there's nothing that hinders you coming into the very presence of God. Okay? Because you are the righteousness of God in Christ. I say that because people are very sin conscious. And if you're sin conscious, then sin cannot stand in the presence of God. You can't come into the presence of God when you're laden down with sin. You let them go. You throw them out. They're no longer there. And it's so easy, guys. I think it's too easy sometimes. We just don't believe it can be that easy because he's done all the work. He's done the work. Okay? All right. Um, just a, a, a number C, which is just down towards the the lower bottom of the page, well, upper bottom of the page. God is faithful and he demands faithfulness. You see there's a passage, there's lots of scriptures there. What, do, what page are you on? 14. Oh, I'm on the wrong page. Okay. Okay. And he does demand faithfulness, but because he is faithful. Now he demands faithfulness, but he, he helps us. He gives us the provision for that. He makes it work. If we'll put our trust in him. Okay. Now, now in section two, the absolute bottom line for leadership equals faithfulness. That should that should be written on your fridge mm -hmm. and and uh, stuck up there on the fridge. And you every time we go there, um, I can remember um Hal Oxley taught me for, for years, he used to write out little cards, just only about so square, write scriptures on them, and he'd put them in his pocket and he'd have one on either side. And uh, because he knew the importance of knowing the word of God and how the word of God penetrates into your spirit, into your mind, and whenever something is needed, it's there. It's there. And this is one of the reasons why I got you guys to just learn Psalm 1. And uh, so you you understand that's really such a powerful psalm. It tells you God's provision in every way. It tells you the end of the unrighteous and it tells you the end of the righteous. And God is with you all the time. And you will, everything is yours if you put your trust in him. And he says, if you, um, um, let's start, <laughs> now I've got a blank. Um, blessed is the man who works not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the way of sinners, but sits or sits in the seat of the but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he walks day and night. He lives day and night. Mm -hmm. Now we know that the, the, the law, we're not under law anymore, but we're under the condition of the we are under a different law, not the law of sin and death. We're under that law as the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And that's made us free from the law of sin and death. But God has boundaries. He said, I want you to walk within this, not because I'm, I'm a grump or, or, or lousy or something like that. I want you to walk in them because if you do, you'll be blessed. You'll have the fullness of life. Good. Okay. In A, it says God chooses leaders on the basis of faithfulness. And I know you would have read those scriptures. Faithfulness is the foundation. That's the first thing God looks for, faithfulness. And he works to make us faithful. He gives it, He never gives up on us. Never, ever gives up on us. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm a really, really, really blessed man. I'm going to embarrass my wife here. But um, one thing that Pauline has is faithfulness. Never in any at any time in our marriage have I ever had a doubt about Pauline. Ever. Ever. In any way, You're shape, manner. Save that for Valentine's Day, mate. It's Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell it whenever I want. <laughs> because if you know, and I can trust her in anything. She'll always be there. And I've dragged her around 
uh, from pillar to post, and, you know, all my ministry and all that sort of thing. And she's the whole time she's come kicking and screaming, but but she's come and she's always been there and she's always been faithful. And, and I, you know, I, I, I see scriptures, I see things like this. I think, yeah, I am a blessed man because that, and that is the reality of, of um, and where we tired anybody that says something wrong about my wife? Touch you, my wife, I'm breaking your face. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, you know, this God, that's the way God feels about us. He feels so good about us and he wants to pour his faithfulness into us. And it's his gift. Everything, all of this is a gift and it comes from the Holy Spirit. Later on in the course, we're going to look at the, look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the very nature of it, and it, that's all we need. If we will follow those gifts, those characteristics of the Holy Spirit, man, oh, man, we've got a wonderful life ahead of us. And everybody can look at each other and trust. And there's no, there's no anger, there's no hurt, there's no deceit, there's no bitterness, there's no jealousy, there's no nothing. It's just, you know, I care about you guys. It doesn't matter where you are, I care. And, and I know you care for me. Well, that sort of thing. That's so, there's such a peace in that. Such a peace. Okay, number B says, Godly men of the New Testament chose leaders on the basis of faithfulness. Read that. Read those scriptures in your own time. I'm just giving you a bit of a... Um, um... Now, remember I asked you to have a look at, at Luke 16. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a very interesting story. And uh, how many of you have a look at that? Well, I didn't understand it. Yeah. To be honest, I did not understand it. I had to get the concordance out and read it. And even that confused me. But I did get the basic principle of the... It's something you grow through in this particular passage of Scripture. It's an incredibly powerful passage of Scripture. And and it's it's very uh, very unusual. We did read through it, I promise, but it was about two months ago. And That's all right. It has evaded me. I believe you. We discussed it, right? We did. We did. Yeah. yeah. It's actually about a battle between the flesh of man and the spirit of God in us. Yeah. And I actually wrote that before. And that's pretty much what that is. It's about us trying to do the right thing in every step of our lives yeah. because if we're not trusted in the things of earthly things then what's god going to use us later on for sure or sure. use us for his purposes yeah yeah, yeah. if we're faithful in little things that's then right god will give us big things yeah yeah but it's um, usually about yeah. it's usually about the battle between man's flesh and the spirit of god yeah yeah making that right choice yeah. and yeah. doing the, the right thing that God wants us to do. That's, That's it. What I think. Yeah, it is basically about that. But it's also it's also about um, um, God recognizing that there's something in um, in our in our makeup that can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. And we can't yeah. walk with a foot in both worlds. And this is what this servant is troubled with. And his master has said, Oh, you're real shrewd about this. You've really, you know, you've made a you've made a place for you back on the earth, but you'll never you'll never be part of my kingdom. You're out. You've you've been cunning, but that just that just indicates the sort of person you are. You've been prepared to cheat me. I'm your I'm I'm your your provider. And this is this is something that we Sometimes, for some strange reason, we don't think God's watching. And this is talking about God and us. We don't think God's watching. I'll just cheat a little bit. That comes out of a, a situation where we don't quite believe in God. And, you know, sometimes I think, ah, people with that, I can understand somebody saying, oh, I'm mucking up big time, Lord, and I'm not doing too well here. But when when you say, oh, I guess I'm watching. That's dumb. And yeah, I've, I've occasionally on um, when I can't sleep, there's a um, show on YouTube called 
It's just called the Bible. And there's about 10 episodes in it from different parts of the Bible. I was looking at David at one stage a couple of weeks back. How David, this man who was so sold out to God, and he, you know, he killed Goliath with a, 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 a statement like, who are you to defy the armies of the living God? He just knew his God so well. But he got involved in everything that was wrong because he got corrupted by the riches. And I watched the story of Solomon. Solomon, beautiful man, until he got into the wrong thing. He started to serve foreign God. How do you do that? When you've, you've met God, what's wrong with you? You've met God. He's actually met God in the temple. God filled the temple that he built. He's talked to God, and now he's chasing after stones and bricks. And I, I don't get that. And, you know, um, it's just, do we do that? Yes. Yeah, you're, you're waving it around. Yes. <laughs> Constantly yeah. on video games. Yes. Yeah. And oh. anything that... Is that our God? Yeah, can be. My word. If anything that separates you from God and becomes more important, I don't know whether I've shared my golf thing with you, but when I became a Christian, I was a very good golfer. And <laughs> I, I'd won the local club championship and all that sort of thing. And everything's going. And I, I was really, I, I had a time when, uh, as, a, as a kid, I was an assistant pro. And I was, re I was really looking at, I wanted to play professional golf. And uh, anyhow, God came into my life. And uh, that meant Sunday I couldn't play golf. Nah, God will understand. And uh, I, used to, I said, God, you and me on the first tee. Well, he put up with that for about six weeks. Then he took the swing away. And if your swing's gone, so is your game of golf. Oh, yeah. And do you know from that day to this, if I play social golf, the swing's there. If I play competitive golf, uh-uh, you still can't do it because that was my God. And that that competed with God all the time. And God just took it away. So whatever it is, and it can be something like you can even use it to glorify God. But if, God if you put it before him and, you know, people with severe talents, really heavy talents, they get a little bit carried away and they put that before God. And God must be number one. Let him give it back to you. I can remember my, my mentor said, you got a ministry, give it to God now and walk away. If he gives it back to you, he can trust you with it. That's what he did. And he gave it back to me. But it's been a walk. Uh, it's been, a, you know, we just get so carried away with who we can be and who we, that's not faithfulness. God first, God second, third, fourth, and every bit after that. God must be first. Okay, where was I up to? Faithfulness in small things. He starts you off with a small thing, sometimes a big thing, but wherever, wherever he starts, it's the most important thing for you. And, you know, I've seen churches uh, been involved. You know, our church grandfather's father was uh, one of the most faithful men I've ever come from. He used to hand out the, we, we didn't have uh, um, no overheads. Uh, overheads or. Headbooks. It was just a book, a little, hymn, like a hymn book, chorus book. And he'd hand them out and he'd greet people and make them feel good. And, and, and honestly, he was just a great guy. And everybody remembered him as the guy that really cheered them up. That was his ministry. He loved it. He sewed himself into it. That's all he wanted. He was glorifying God. That was his fulfillment. And God gave him so many blessings. And, but, you know, it doesn't mean to say you've got to start there, but it's simply be faithful in a little and he'll give you a lot. But be faithful in the little, whether you get the lot or not. Just be faithful. Okay. The test of faithfulness in another man's house and goals. That was that's the story of that 
Will I be faithful for another man? What happens when you think, oh, okay, why should I be faithful? Why should, why should I be sur surrendered to that particular person when I'm probably more qualified than them? I'm probably more than, I'm probably more capable than them. Why should I be faithful to them? Because God's put you there. God has put you there. And he said, that's what I want you to do. Be a blessing to them. That's the fulfillment of the reason why you've, why you've got God in your life. The test of faithfulness in natural things is if, if somebody's putting it in your hands, and this is what he's talking about, um, he had all these um, responsibilities, the finances, um, and he was stealing 50%. 50% of, of his life was stuff by, by only charging half price. That's theft. And yet his master acknowledged that he was cunning because he made a place for himself back in the world. He lived, he was walking with a foot in both worlds, but he made the jump to the old to the other side. Um, let's have a look at Matthew 25, verse 15. Okay. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went out on the journey, according to his own ability, that person's ability. So his expectations were never too, too high. He's not asking any one of these people to do anything that they're not capable of doing. He knew what their, their ability was. He knew the extent of their ability. The, then he, he who received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents because he was, he was a pretty conscientious guy. And likewise, he who received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his, mark, his, his uh, Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of these servants came and settled accounts with them. Okay. Just without reading any further, um, with the, particularly in relation to the last one, the one talent. Surely, if you if you don't think that you're capable of making more, wouldn't it be wise to uh, hang on to it to give it back? Give me some comments on that. Like give the gift back, give the yeah. talent back. Give the talent back. Mm. But he didn't, he hid it. Yeah. But, but if he didn't feel he could be trusted, why hold it and bury it? And yeah. Was he concerned that you know, he was going to lose it or it was going to be taken from him? Mm. What about his attitude? Wouldn't he? Wouldn't it have been better to risk um, investing that? Even if he lost it, his master would have been happy that he took the actual risk. That's it, Jen. His faithfulness to his master. He's looking after himself. His, father, his, his master wanted him to do something with it. The other two did something with, with theirs, and he blessed them. Later on in the story, he blessed those two. But this guy was only focusing on uh, me. I've got, to, I've got to preserve myself. And, and God says, no, I want you to step out. I, I've, I've told you, you you can cope with this. You're not trusting me. You're not faithful in what I've asked you to do. You're hiding it away. And that's the same with, you know, I, I find that um, unless there's a very good reason, I know somebody's got a gift, 
and they won't use it. There's got to be a good reason um, before I'll, I'll say, well, you're perhaps doing a good thing. But if you've got a gift and you won't use it, uh, even though it's it's um, may you may think it's not worth it or whatever the case may be, you need to be you, you need to honor God with that gift. Every good gift comes from God. The word tells us that. You are, we are all gifted from God. Any gift we have comes from Him. But you get this false humility, humility, and all that sort of stuff. That's not what God wants. He wants faithfulness from us. Do the best you can with what you've got. Don't wait to win Tats Lotto before you step out. <laughs> Just do the best you can with what you've got and keep doing it. To God, do everything to God, everything to Him. He's, he's the be all and end all. Okay, go across the page. The three tests of faithfulness. Oh, no, sorry. I, thought that I, I turned the page back. <laughs> B, responsibility. Your delegated authority. When God tells you to do something or a person who has been um, called of God to delegate their authority to you, do it with all your heart. All your heart. Doesn't matter. You know, people people need to say, I can count on that man. You know, one of the worst things I've ever experienced is using a Christian tradesman to do a job and he did a lousy job. You know, and, and I used him because he was he was a Christian. I thought you you surely you you'll be credible. No. And I, I really felt bad about that. And, and that happens too often. And so often people now, Christians, won't use um, Christian tradesmen. I don't know why that is. I really don't. They'll put, they'll, they'll advertise them in the paper. You'll see the fish advertising they're a Christian, calling the Christians to support them. I've got a, a guy who's, uh, who's my white ant man, checks out the house. And David Kotzer, I don't know if you know David. I've heard the name, Kotze. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's, he's a Christian chapel. guy, and he honestly he 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 drives you nuts. He gets into every little nook and cranny, looking for everything, and talk talk for like off an iron pot. <laughs> but but the th oh, this is going on on to here, isn't it? <laughs> Hope you're not listening, Dave. Love you, mate. <laughs> and um, he is he's an incredible um, uh, operator. And uh, I recommend him to anybody. And um, but that's a good one. And that, of course, you get good reports and you get bad reports. But the thing is, you have a responsibility to God. If you're going to say, "I'm I'm a Christian and I'm doing my trade," remember you're representing God. Pauline and I pray every day that um, when we pray, we have our morning prayer time together. And I pray for, for the business where I work down at the dry cleaners and that God will bless the business and bless um, uh, the works of my hands that I work as unto him in the place and all that sort of thing. And God is with you in that sort of thing. You ask him to, to him. And we, we are very rarely, she knows who I am. Occasionally she'll start to talk to me about the Lord, and but not often. And, uh, but, um, yeah. I reckon I'll sign but she'll sure get through to it. And she can never, she's, at least she can, she can rely on the fact that I have the work ethic. And uh, that's something that's a blessing. Okay. Accountability, your trustworthiness. And that's, that's um, referred to in Luke 16 too. Are you trustworthy? This, this servant wasn't, was he? He didn't, um, um, because he didn't look after the do his job properly, um, he cut the 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 value of the the stuff that he he was um, responsible for in half, and his um, his master got nothing. Well, got half, and he got half. Let's have a look at Luke nineteen seven.
Eu vou aqui ver se eu estou bem. Uh, what do I got there? It's not there. Story of Zacchaeus. Yeah, hang on. Talking about Zacchaeus. Yeah. I, I'm not used to using this thing. I went, went haywire. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich, and he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, where he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he's gone to be a guest with a sinner. Then Jackie stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I gave half of my goods to the poor, and I've taken anything from anyone by I and if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. This is a mature attitude. And it's, it's something that we need to look to and say, I can't judge anybody else. I've got to just, I, I, j, j, Christians have a problem sometimes. I say, I, I'm not, don't judge me or I can't be, you know, I can't judge anybody. Don't judge, somebody might say you, don't judge me. And they say we shouldn't judge. But the scriptures say in uh, um, 1 Corinthians 11, judge yourself before God. We do need to judge ourselves before God. Are we walking uprightly before God? And um, it's an important part of our, of our Christian walk. Any comments on that? The whole idea of judging? And, of course, God tells us to understand something that needs to be judged and assessed. What about somebody who's, um, like he talks to us about wolves in sheep's clothing coming to the church in these last days? We're going to see a bit of that. False prophet. Are we called to judge that? Of course we are. So don't be, and the enemy uh, will come in and say, don't judge, don't judge. Yes, you do. You should judge. You should be all, always aware, but not with the wrong attitude, with the right attitude to be able to say, I'm, and I'm very much like that with, if, and I don't, I don't know if you've noticed, if somebody touches that church, I go ballistic. They teach something that's not there, that's wrong, that's against the word. I just get a little bit upset because that is leading the people in that church astray. I'm not the senior pastor there, but they're my people because I'm part of that, those people. And I'll protect them with everything I can because God's given me a responsibility as a leader to do that. I just I won't brush it away. And we need to we need to be aware of that. Gently restore people by all means. But if they're if they're aggressive, you need to be able to stand up. And of course. What are, the, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness. Love that way. And love the people that way. But if, if they won't listen, Jesus pulled out a whip and drove them out of the temple. Do it. You know, that's enough. Sorry, you're not going to make my the house, my father's house, a house of usury. So, uh, we do have a lot to learn, don't we? It's, and, and really, the Bible gives us all the answers. And we've got to have the courage to stand up and be prepared to say, I'm not going to cop that. No. And take people on. Not aggressive, not necessarily aggressively, but what do you mean by that? You know, um, I don't quite see 
that in scripture where, where does that come from what's the teaching you're talking about mm. and uh, make sure you don't don't come from an uninformed with an uninformed argument mm. come with a fully informed argument in the word of god mm. and this is one of the reasons why we need to know the word of god so important so it's just so important okay I think we've probably covered everything that we need to cover. I think in regards to maturity too, I guess that was Zacchaeus showing his maturity and repenting his actions. Yes. His back. But also I think it shows the immaturity of the other people who are displeased and grumble. Spot on. It really is. And usually you find there's, there's a lot of people, unfortunately, um, and I struggle with, I think, okay, Lord, what are you doing in the lives of these people? Who are always critical, always finding a fault with somebody, always, you know, um, but instead of looking at the good, um, I, that's something I, I was um, I was brought up in, you know, in reason. I had a Christian ethic. My mum and dad were, were Christian. They were, they, they were believers. Um, and I went to Sunday school and I was an older boy in the Church of England church and all that sort of thing. And, and so I had an understanding of the difference between right and wrong. But um, where was I going with that? Did you close that door again, Paul? <laughs> no, that's, not, that's all right. Just a personal joke. When we get to the stage, we we'll walk the other, go through the pantry door. And finally, like, why am I in here? Just can't remember. <laughs> just can't remember. And that's exactly what I've just done. <laughs> I was talking about something. I've forgotten what I was talking about. You're talking about being critical. No, I'm not. And the maturity of the critical. Yeah. And then I talked about people uh, who are negative all the time. Yes, yeah, people who are negative. You grew up in the church. You're an old um, church. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I got it. All right, well, Pam, I'll, I'll just say something different that I yeah. picked up. Um, so when when we all stand before God, and when yeah. you were saying before that you don't understand why people Christians behave that way, um, I think it's he where he says he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Yes, and because that because in the old days, sheep and goats actually look similar, and they sometimes behave similar. But they aren't necessarily the sheep of the shepherd. That's what I. That's what I have yeah. picked up on. Yeah. Hope that makes sense. It does. Yeah, it does make sense. That's why those scriptures are there, and the wheat and the tar, the tears. Mm. Um, we um, and we don't know. You won't. The thing about using the, the comparison of wheat and tears is you. In their growing stage, you can't tell the difference yeah. between them yeah. until you see what fruit they bear. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's so important um, that you say, okay, what's the fruit in that person's life? Mm -hmm. What are, what have they achieved in God? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not wrong to look for that. In fact, God tells us to do that um, because that will demonstrate whether they're fair income about their walk or they're not and um, um, it's it's and and it's a growing thing be, be be very very conscious of the opportunity to take every or the, the chance opportunity to take every opportunity really to to um, just get to know God better in every way yeah I still struggle to this day trying to, as a parent, trying to just remind Michael, you know, because um, he, he said, that, I'll, I'll give you, he doesn't want, like going to church because of the people in there don't behave the way they should. And I certainly understand that and I have to keep reminding him that it's not about the people of why we go. Yeah. Um, but he, because I'm, uh, I'm 
at a different stage in my Christian maturity. He can see that, but he doesn't understand why everybody else isn't there. Hmm. Since they've been Christians all their lives or blah, blah, blah. And um, I said, well, not all of them are on the same path. And and it, it, it pains me because he still refuses to acknowledge any of that. He doesn't want to know people who behave in those manners. And funny enough, second one comes along and starting to see the same things and I'm like no no so I'm I'm struggling still trying to teach my kids don't look at what people do look at what you can do to continue your walk with God and your growth with God because it's just so hard and it's so heartbreaking Oh, yes, it is. I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm. It is. Yeah. And um, this is this is where I believe the church must grow more. Mm. And this, the, the whole, you know, um, unfortunately, um, Jesus didn't say go and start church. He didn't say, he said, go and make disciples. And teaching them to do all the things that I've commanded you to do. Mm -hmm. This is just a start course. And I'm writing something else at the moment and on, on different parts of how we grow, what, what God wants us to do, what the Bible tells us to do as we demonstrate to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to love, loving, loving one another as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Mm -hmm. And it's by this shall all men know that you're my disciples when you have loved one for another. But what you're talking about is the backbiting and everything like that, the little cliques that develop in churches and all that sort of stuff. We've got to be so conscious of the fact that we are there for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember uh, when I had the church over in Epping, um, start, we started off with eight, six, nine people. With um, three and three of those were, were, were our kids, and and uh, we had two th two other couples as well, right? And that was it. No help from anybody. Nothing, and uh, no money. Nothing. We 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 hired a uh, community centre, and when we when I handed it over to the other guy, if everybody turned up, there'd be two hundred and fifty people there. But the thing was, it was a case of um, everybody. Was, was working to, and I, I got a real shock this particular day. Um, I thought, you know, things are going well. And, I'm, and anyhow, this lady walked up, grabbed me by the tie, because we used to wear ties then. And she said, Stop, I've been trying to talk to you for weeks. Will you stop? <laughs> and I was so, so busy, I forgot about the people. And we've got, to, that's, that's, that's the church. It's the, the church is the people. So many people have walked away. Yeah. Well. It's sad. Yeah. Because that, and they'll say, oh, there's no love there. Mm. It's all there, but we we get so involved with doing work for the Lord, we forget that we're there for people. We're, we're there to love people. Any of you guys, on, on, on Jen, you're going to sleep. <laughs> Anybody else there has got anything to say? She's gone she mute. Is, I can't she hear. There you go. Now say it. Now, I'm, no, I'm not going to sleep. I'm just agreeing with you. There, yeah, with the the supposed lack of love in the church and the I'm not saying our church and the cliques that that come up in church, you know, and like you're not good enough to be in this little group and you're not good enough to be in that little group. I've been involved in those places and they're not good yeah yeah and believe it or not you know i know that there's there's um um a lot of people that they never experienced that at any stage in their christian war they are just so sold out to being part of a group part of the part of the church they just that is so it's something that we should always be aware that that's that's a possibility we, we can find ourselves so drawn to a certain group of people let's face it in the flesh in our in our human human attitudes there's people we like mm. and there's people we don't like there's people we'll fellowship with and there's people that are yuck really 
<laughs> you know, I'm just being totally honest, but God says no. Love them all. Loves them all, and, and you just be there for them when they need you. And, uh, um, you know, I try to, I, I try to, you know, I say to the people, I'm for you 24 7. You can ring me anytime. Jesus was on call 24 7, anytime. And some of them take me up at two and three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> take me up on that. And I think, what did you do that for, you dum dumps? <laughs> but the thing is, it's so, it's so, um, it's so encouraging, and that people can ring you and you're there for them. It's such an incredible blessing to just to be to be praying for somebody. To it's it's just so good. Yeah, and let God work through you. Yeah. Knowing that you could very well need that someday. And so, the thing is, people, Peter, people will know that you're reliable as yeah. well, and they can do that. Yeah. And and you, even though you're half asleep, yeah. you're still there. You yeah. still answer that call. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So it's that accountability yeah. and being reliable. Which, yeah. hang on, what was that one of these? <laughs> that was one of these, wasn't it? <laughs> it, is, it is one of those. I've got a, got a, a, a bloke just recently. He, he knows I go for a walk very early in the morning and I've only just left the house and he's on the phone. This is very early in the morning, just after dawn. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, he knew. So we had a great time. Had a great time fellowship. He did prayer. That was good. And just be available for people. That's what it's all about. You won't get burnt out. You'll never get burnt out when you, you're saying, God, I just want to be there for somebody. Jesus didn't get burnt out. Burnt out is, is just something when you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. You don't need to be doing. It's uh, You don't get burnt out when you're working for Jesus. You get work, work out, you get burnt out when you do when you're working within a religion type thing and doing things like that but not when you're working for Jesus you won't get burnt out I promise you I haven't been burnt out in nearly 50 years can't get enough <laughs> okay any more oh listen yeah any more questions about what we've no question mate. yeah so how do boundaries work like how do you do you set boundaries in that space i do believe you need to do set boundaries with some people yes if they're overstepping your yes. privacy and your own mental health um definitely for sure that's that's um a tact that you have to learn and you might need to ask for help and it's a good one but yeah yeah <laughs> no, but I'm, uh, if, if you are struggling with that, definitely. Uh, yeah, it was just it was a question. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. It That's is. Question. The, the thing is, you, you're called to do something. You will be called to do something. Mm -hmm. And when you say that, you're about, it's like my, my, I struggle getting into the heads of um, the guys down the road here, the police. I'm the police chaplain, as you know. Because they're in a job where you can't show weakness to any of your other workmates because then they say, oh, I can't trust such and such. They're on the edge. And uh, so they won't talk to me when I go down there. So what I do is I tell them, I say, you can come up to my place whenever you need me. And sometimes that could be in the middle of the night. Um, and, you know, I can remember... Um, Back in when I was working here in, in Wodonga, um, one man night shift by yourself. And I had three fatal accidents in one week on the Hume Highway. Well, I was ready to climb the wall. I wasn't a Christian back in those days. And, and yeah, you know, scraping bodies up off the road and that sort of thing. Pretty savage, I think. And um, um, they, they're doing that all the time. And it's even worse for them now. Because they're dealing with incredible things that I didn't have to deal with. They had no respect from the public and all that sort of stuff. 
And uh, back in those days, when I was here, we, we ran the town. The police did a good job um, because they were, had the support. But now these guys are really struggling. They're really struggling. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, how do I, how do I get through to these guys? And it's 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 only in in an environment away from the work that they can they they can do that they can come really pour out their heart. So um, it's a calling on your life, and that's mine. Um, but you, yours may be completely different. Don't open that door. God, God will show you. Uh, and it's like I, I mentioned very early tonight. We're all different. We've all got different callings. I'm sorry, I failed to say, where are the boundaries in that? Well, the boundaries are, are where God puts you, like, you, you, unless you really feel that you want to um, do that, don't open the door. Is that what you meant, or did you mean where people suddenly found your space? Well, I suppose that would be an example of someone overstepping, mm -hmm. like, your boundary, but I was sort of wondering how... Like, how do you deal with that in that space? Because that's a very open, right. there. open door, double yeah. open door. Is yeah. that what, what I do is assess the person. You can get people who will use you. And I do a lot of counselling. But I know, and the, the, one of my boundaries is, if I'm counselling somebody, I, I tell them to do a certain thing for their counselling. Next time they come back, I'll say, have you done that? No, I said, go away. Go away and come back when you have. And that's the boundary I put there. Because people, it's hard to say people will, um, uh, they'll drain you just because they want to be heard. They really want to, and that's something you've got to realise, that they want to talk out, they want to talk to you, they want you to, to just be your but their buddy, and if if you're trying to help them, you can't do that. And so that's when you determine the boundaries yourself. And um, so there's no blueprint to say, um, yeah, everything's the same. It's it's when you go into that situation, um, and I'm very very cautious with with some of the ones that um, there's there's a couple that won't come back to me now. Because I just kept saying, go and do what I've, what I've said. Um, but, but I've noticed that Peter keeps re, re, um, coming up and, and saying that he had a mentor, which is his mentor, Hal. Yeah. Hal, Hal Oxley, is that right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and so you, if you've got people overstepping your boundary that you've opened the door and you don't know how to close it, um, <laughs> then I would recommend doing what Peter has going to find someone that you can go who and, and ask them who is better versed than you are to be able to how can you show me how to close this door because I'm really struggling go and find a, a mentor of some sort a good Christian one Peter Kim um you know they they've got the right act the right words they're both gentle they're not going to be harsh um you don't come to me yeah. <laughs> no. And, and someone who's brass and might put their foot in it. No. You've got to find the right the right people. Yeah, so it's, and and also number one, you know, you've got to go there and and maybe ask him to help you um show you the right person to go to and look for the right burst person to give you the right words to share. Yeah. And maybe palm them off to Peter. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. You didn't. It's just gone all over YouTube. Oh, no. <laughs> so everybody, that was Julie. <laughs> and Peter's number is oh four. <laughs> oh, phew! You stopped. <laughs> and Julie's number is oh four. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is and it's an important part of growing yeah. and you've got to get to the state there's times when I just shut down and say no no more and but, but you you draw your you make your own boundary mm -hmm. and um but you if you do that you you'll never get worn out you'll never get burnt out mm -hmm. and look after yourself and make sure God's involved mm -hmm. God will not burn you out 
If you get burnt out, you're not doing what God wants you to do. Mm. Yeah. That's true. Okay, now next week we're going to be starting. That's more or less the end of the start of, of just preparation. Now we're going to get to the choosing. How, why Paul chose Timothy to mentor him. Why Paul mentored, chose Timothy so he could be mentored by Paul, is what I meant. <laughs> so, uh, um, and that's important. Um, it, it's, uh, um, I, I've actually had a lot, been blessed with, with having a lot of really good teachers in my life. And this Frank Damasio is one of them. And uh, strangely enough, I can remember the first time I met him, I went to a, uh, I was at Pell Oxley's Bible College. And um, uh, we went to a place in Baronia, I think it was. And Frank was a, a, um, a Jesus freak back in the 60s and 70s, a hippie. And um, he, he he gives the, the whole thing. He's a, you know, he's a really, um, he was sold out for Jesus. And they used to have all those, the hippie dress with Jesus all over them and all that sort of thing. And uh, um, he's now got one of the biggest churches in America. But um, he's an incredible, I'll have to get some of his uh, sermons. He, you, he, he's such an entertaining speaker. And he, you, you learn so much because he uses good stories to really impress upon you things that will last, stay there with you for ages. And um, he's uh, he's grown all the way through. He's he's never stopped growing, and he's always he's always prepared to share uh, the things where he went wrong and all that sort of stuff. It's cool. He, 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 I can remember one particular time he was talking about when he had um, um, oh, there was it was it would have been in the 70s when when um, the Holy Spirit revival was on pretty much worldwide and the speaking in tongues and there was a lot of opposition particularly from many of the American churches about the whole idea of speaking in tongues and they had they used to write up they'd have news but they'd have cameras there and all that sort of stuff to watch people baptized by the Holy Spirit anyhow um, Frank had different ways of, he'd be praying for people and it came out in the newspaper that he was he was manipulating them and uh, how he he said I don't know how they thought I was doing that but he said I, I had my hand on them and I'm speaking in tongues beside them and they'd start to speak in tongues. So anyhow, uh, they were saying, oh, he's, what he's doing, he's feeding this into their head. So uh, anyhow, he had the, the, the news cameras were all there. And uh, um, he said, okay, all the people came out to be baptised in the Holy Spirit. And he said, now I'm going to pray. He stood way back from it. Didn't touch one person. And uh, anyhow, he prayed and he said, okay, speak in tongues. And he said, under my breath, I'm saying, there was a nutcase. This is not going to work. Well, the Holy Spirit fell and everybody spoke in tongues. And it was incredible. But he's that sort of person. He's very powerful in his ministry. And he's very powerful. He's an incredible heal healing ministry and all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, so he hasn't been out here for a while. Oh, gosh, it's been years. Yeah. What's his name, Peter? Frank Damasio. He's gone. got <laughs> D E M A double Z I O. <laughs> That's an Italian name for you, isn't it? <laughs> he looks like a little Italian. Yeah. Well, the last time I saw him, but you know, dark hair, yeah. thick hair. Tall. Lovely guy. He married Kevin Connor's daughter. He was the pastor of um, one of the big churches. He, he was a very good friend with Pastor Oxford. He used to work for Pastor Oxford and they come to the Lord 
you come to the Lord together or whatever. They used to have Bible okay. studies during the day. We might close this down now. Kevin Connor started. Can we do that? Um, yeah. Yeah, Good night. Pause. Uh, I'll just, you don't have to go away. I'll just pause. Stop. stop. The top corner. Top left. Top, top, top left. the top corner. Yeah, that's the one. This one. And